This is Adina Travel, Dean Jacobs, reporting to you from Ethiopia, Africa. In my quest to gain some insight on the Sudanese population in Nebraska, I've come to Ethiopia, where many now living in Nebraska once pass through refugee camps. In Gambella, I was offered a wonderful surprise. Out of the generosity of project coordinator Rune and Dyer of Denmark and the mostly Dutch flight crew, I was invited to join two flights of refugees being flown back to South Sudan for voluntary repatriation. My name is Rune Dyr. I am the project manager and I am from Denmark. The project is uh, repatriating somewhere around 8,000 Sudanese refugees back to Sudan from mainly Central African Republic and now Ethiopia. And my job is to get things going. From a personal point of view, just being on a plane where everybody's singing and dancing and, and is really happy to be going back is, has been a very big experience for me. That's nothing I've seen before, probably nothing I will see again ever on any commercial flight in Europe. They were on the tail end of a project that had moved almost 7,500 refugees home since last December from Central Africa, Kenya, and now Ethiopia. Peace in South Sudan has brought with it the opportunity for people to return home. Some have been away for up to 20 years. Early in the morning, we arrive at the airport in Gambella, where the Sudanese refugees have been waiting for processing. The United Nations and the International Office for Migration staff shuffle through the paperwork of the people who have volunteered to return home to their homeland in Sudan. Some look nervous, others excited as they wait for instructions. A leader of the group called Marco is requested to tell the group of 50 to use the bathroom before they leave. He speaks in the Dinka language to the group, please use the bathrooms before we leave on our flight, as he points his finger in the direction of the shed that houses the toilet. Eventually, after about an hour of waiting and paperwork, the group begins to board the plane. Once on the plane, the flight attendant, Masaro, helps buckle in the passengers, none who have ever flown before. She's a true saint, as I watch her change the diapers of countless babies in the walkway. The captain of the flight was Dirk Norder from the Netherlands. It's uh, Dirk Norder. I'm a captain of the Fokker 50 that flies for UNHCR IOM here in Africa, out of Gambella at this moment. These people have been moved around a lot, and at one time, We've moved people who have been away from their families for more than 16 years. So, yeah, you see them smiling and then recognizing still after 60 years their families and, 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 and the people they all know from the old villages. That's, that, that's a good thing to see. Jerome was the first officer as they guided the plane through the clouds over Sudan to safety. As we took off, I couldn't help but wonder. What was going through the minds of the people as they stared out the windows, watching Ethiopia fade away? For many, it was all they have ever known. A few children took advantage of the cool air to have a little nap on our two-hour flight. Others were given paper and encouraged to draw pictures to pass the time. I tried to help out where I could by visiting with people and, and listening to what they wanted to share with me. As the plane began to land, singing started to come from the seats of the passengers. People were happy to be home. The doors popped open, and in the blink of an eye, we were unloading people in Sudan as the next step in processing began. Many haven't seen family members in years and they talked about, hoping to be able to recognize people they haven't seen since their childhood. As our plane leaves Sudan, I peer out the window and I see the passengers we dropped off standing in the skeletal resting frame that poses as a terminal, and I wonder, what will their future be? I hope. It will be better than the skeletal remains of these planes that line the runway. 
we wave goodbye, and our empty plane heads to Jima, Ethiopia, the closest place to find fuel for the plane. The flight offers a chance to grab a short nap, and often a better sleep than the hot hotel rooms where the electricity always fails, killing the ceiling fan and leaving you to melt in the night. In Jima, the crew would fuel the plane and, and themselves with a Coke. Repairs on the plane were the ongoing responsibility of the flight engineer, Searle, and generally everyone pitched in where and, and when needed, like when it was time to change the tires on the plane. Quiet moments are hard to find, but everyone gave Runin a little space for a moment as he battled some food poisoning, and maybe with a job like this, a little space is needed from time to time to come to terms with the enormous emotional task of bringing people home. I made some new friends, and I was sad to say goodbye. The flight crew dropped me off at the GM airport after the second flight, saving me a day and a 12-hour bus ride. And as I said goodbye to the crew, Captain Derrick said to me, Stay at the airport. We'll do a flyby. So waving goodbye to the crew as the plane took off from the runway in Jima, I stood there, alone, on the tarmac like a solitary tree in a large open space. Several minutes later, the plane comes roaring back, flying quite low and much to the bewilderment of the Jima airport workers. As the plane flew by, the captain tipped the wings from side to side three times before jetting back up into the blue sky. And in that moment, my eyes welled up as the wings of hope waved goodbye. Tune in again. There's more to come from Ethiopia. This is Dean Jacobs reminding you to check your compass because you never know where you might go with the Dean of Travel.